name is Peter Matheson. I'm the, the principal of the university, um, uh, and it's my very great pleasure to start events uh, and, and to introduce um, Shannon Vallow, who's a member of our academic staff who's here with us, who's going to um, uh, be a, an important part of this panel. We'll tell you a bit more about the, the, the specialist areas, which I know little about, and she will uh, cover in great detail. So thank you very much for being here. It is a great pleasure to, to be here in person um, back into uh, Palo Alto. We have, I have done alumni events here before, although not in this venue. Um, and many of you um, uh, will have, have, I hope, kept up with the, the various things going on in, in Scotland and in Edinburgh. And I'm going to just give you a very brief update on one or two recent successes and then lead into the discussion on AI, as Chris has, uh, has said. Um, the, the reason we haven't been here for three or four years, of course, is obvious to you because of the pandemic. Um, and one of the things that I do regard as a success of the University of Edinburgh is the contributions that we made to the pandemic and to understanding it and combating it. And you'll be aware that we've um, got uh, a, an excellent medical school, an excellent vet school, um, and a great deal of strengths in various other subject areas, including data science. And in some ways, it was the coming together of data science and public health um, that gave us such a strong position in the pandemic. Some of the best data in the world on the early understanding of the pandemic, why it was that some people got sick and some people didn't, why is it that some people got admitted to intensive care unit and somebody didn't, and some people died and some people didn't, without any obvious explanations from uh, uh, the normal uh, uh, issues around health susceptibility. Some of the best work on, on that subject was done in Scotland, because in Scotland, uh, every citizen has a unique health identifier, a number that can be tracked and can be traced through all kinds of healthcare uh, interactions. And using that fact and using our computing power, colleagues in the Usher Institute, one of our uh, public health institutes, did some amazing work trying to understand those questions. Why is it affecting particular populations worse than others? And what are the determinants of whether you get ill or not? And the, um, one of the many studies that was published in that highlighted six uh, genes where if you had the wrong version, the so-called wrong version of, the, of all six genes, you did badly when you got COVID. If you had the right version, uh, you did well. And in, in between, anything in between, any other mixture of the right and wrongs, and, the, and obviously right and wrong is a sort of simplest, simplistic way of describing them, but genes which predispose to a particular type of immune response. Um, if you had the wrong versions or the, or the, or the version that, that coded badly for the COVID response, um, then you're more likely to succumb. And the great thing about that study, as well as identifying six susceptibility genes, for three of those genes, the pathways that those genes were regulating were already amenable to existing drugs, drugs that were already on the market. So as well as highlighting susceptibility, that study also highlighted the direction that therapies should be taking. So th that was one contribution. There were many others studying about vaccine effectiveness, duration of, of effect and whatnot. And uh, some of you have already heard me say that the, one of my colleagues, Aziz Sheikh, pu published a paper in The Lancet uh, a couple of weeks ago about the duration of vaccine effectiveness in COVID and his sample size for that population. The number of subjects whose data he was reporting was 58 million. Um, because that was a study showing, uh, taking data from every citizen in the UK. Um, uh, getting a sample size of 58 million in any kind of uh, study is pretty in impressive, and that's the kind of data power that, that Aziz and colleagues have. So we're very proud of the contributions that the University of Edinburgh and our collaborating colleagues made to the understanding of the pandemic. And we're also turning our thoughts to the next pandemic. Sadly, there will be further pandemics. We don't know whether it's this year or next year or 100 years time, but there will be uh, pandemics unfortunately to come and we hope to be better prepared as a result of the learning that we and others have had from uh, COVID. So um, there's, there's a sort of silver lining, if you like, in terms of the university's response to, to COVID. Um, COVID is obviously an example of a zoonotic disease, a disease that's moved from animal populations into human populations. And it's likely that there will be further pandemics of zoonotic disease in future. So understanding animal health and understanding human health are more closely linked probably than they ever have been in the past. And because the University of Edinburgh has one of the world's great medical schools, 
uh, actually uh, just approaching its 300th anniversary. So we have the oldest medical school in the English-speaking world. We also have one of the world's great vet schools. And so we're in a very strong position to link animal health and human health. And a lot of that work is, is going on uh, as we speak. And just today we've been visiting UC Davis, uh, which also has one of the world's great vet schools and also has a very good medical school. And we've got a lot of linkages already with UC Davis, but one of the other reasons that we're here is to try and build some of these partnerships. So when we were in the East Coast, we met with Cornell, which is another one of the universities that has real strengths in both medicine and veterinary medicine, um, and obviously Davis today. So we're, we're building partnerships with other uh, strong uh, universities to try and think about these, uh, these events for the, for the future. So, uh, I'm very proud of the fact that, that the, as well as the university having to survive COVID and its impacts on our students and our staff and all of our alumni and friends, we also actually made active contributions to uh, defeating it and thinking about the lessons learned for the, for the future. Um, one of the other things that we're proud of in, in, in Edinburgh is what we call our convening power. So we believe that we're a, a suitably neutral location to convene important discussions about the, the future of the world. And we base our terminology a little bit on something called the Edinburgh Conversations, which happened during the Cold War when uh, one of the professors in Edinburgh, John Erickson, convened discussions between the, uh, the West and the East, so the US and Russia, the US and Soviet Union as it then was, um, around uh, trying to resolve the Cold War at a time when officially the countries weren't able to talk to each other. They, they talked to each other in Edinburgh. And those meetings go down in history. It's called the Edinburgh Conversations. And we've um, hijacked that terminology a bit to talk about the Edinburgh Future Conversations. So we're very much thinking this evening about the future. The future is mentioned on the slide there. But the, we, want to have, we want to be able to convene conversations in Edinburgh about the big issues facing the world uh, now and into the future. And, and we had one very good example again during the pandemic. Early on in the pandemic, we had uh, Tony Fauci, who it's a name that I guess everybody here will immediately recognize. And, and Zhongnan Shan is a name you may not recognize, um, who was China's, is China's equivalent of Tony Fauci and led the public health response in China. They'd never before shared a stage uh, to talk about uh, the pandemic or anything else. And we convened a discussion with the two of them, and I was privileged to uh, host that discussion online, obviously, because it was in the pandemic. Um, but listening to the two of them, discussing their experiences, absolutely up to date, right at the, at the forefront of combating the pandemics, was a real privilege. And it's the kind of thing that we think Edinburgh can contribute. We can be the convening place for these kinds of conversations. And we've had some others uh, since then, and we plan more into the future. And I just want to tell you about one building in Edinburgh. So those of you that know Edinburgh well, depending a little bit uh, when you graduated or were in Edinburgh, you may remember the building that was the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary. So just along from McEwen Hall, uh, there was this magnificent building with turrets and roofs and a clock tower, um, which was the main hospital for the city of Edinburgh. And it was the main hospital for um, uh, well over 100 years. Um, it, it then uh, closed in the early part of this century when the new hospital was built out at Little France. And that building, the old building, lay empty and derelict and deteriorating for about 15 or 16 years, desperately needing someone to buy it and do it up. And we were able to do that largely as a result of a government grant that we got as part of a, a deal that we call City Deal, based around our expertise in data science, we were able to build, uh, buy that building and renovate it. It's now partly open. It'll be fully open early next year. And the next time you're in Edinburgh, and I hope it won't be too long before the next time you're in Edinburgh, you'll be able to see a transformed version of the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary, largely preserved. It's a listed building, so we had to preserve most of the exterior. But inside, it's changed beyond recognition. And what was hospital wards, will now be uh, centers of uh, multidisciplinary teaching and research, bringing together people from right across the university to address the world's great problems. And one of the areas of activity in the, that's gonna be called the Edinburgh Futures Institute, and one of the uh, activities in there will be Shannon Valor and her group, the Center for Technomoral Futures, and the national group that she started, which is BRAID, which stands for Bridging Responsible AI Divides. Is that correct? Right, okay. um, uh, so Shannon's uh, chair and her group is, was funded initially by a philanthropic donation from Bailey Gifford, which is an asset management company in Edinburgh that, again, those of you that know Edinburgh well will recognize Bailey, Gri Gif Bailey Gifford. They provided a donation to the university 
for the study of the ethics of artificial intelligence. As part of that, we managed to attract Shannon from this neck of the woods to come to... That was my timer to tell me to stop. Um, at the, um, uh, to come to Edinburgh to lead the work on the ethics of artificial intelligence. And, and you'll, you'll uh, know from, from Shannon's uh, contributions uh, previously, but again, what you hear tonight, that that was a fantastic hire for us, a great catch, and bringing a really important part of uh, the future thinking about artificial intelligence to Edinburgh. We are the, one of two universities on the planet that have been teaching artificial intelligence for 60 years. The other one is Stanford, which is also represented on tonight's panel. Edinburgh was second, and we were teaching uh, artificial intelligence long before it was fashionable, right through the so-called AI winter when it became unfashionable. And so we're now very well placed to start thinking about the future of artificial intelligence and the various issues raised by, especially by recent developments. And I just want to finish by giving you two examples of an external recognition of uh, Edinburgh's excellence in this area. And this is not just me saying we're excellent, this is somebody else saying we're excellent. The two examples are that just after the AI summit that the British government um, convened at Bletchley Park uh, recently, uh, just a, a week or so ago, and I know we had direct, some of your panelists were directly involved, um, the government at the end of that announced 12 new doctoral training centres in aspects of artificial intelligence across the UK. So 12 centres for the UK. Only one university in the UK got more than one. Uh, I'll let you guess which university that was. Um, we got three. So three of the 12 are coming to Edinburgh, nine for the rest of the UK. Um, so we were pretty pleased with that share of the spoils, if you like. And then the other thing that's recently been announced is that um, we currently house the UK's national supercomputer, which is called Archer 2. We've had that and its predecessor, which was Archer 1, uh, for over 20 years. So we have a long track record of hosting supercomputer uh, capability. The next big thing in supercomputing is called Exascale. And the UK currently does not have an Exascale computer. Neither does the US, neither does Europe. China claimed to have one, but there's some dispute about whether it works or not. Everybody's building Exascale computers, including the US. Britain decided about a year ago to have an Exascale computer, and the government put up the money to fund it. And they announced two weeks ago that it'll be in Edinburgh. So we will have the follow-on supercomputer, which has 50 times the computing power of anything that currently exists. So we're very pleased about that vote of confidence uh, and that sort of recognition of the fact that Edinburgh is a trusted place for this kind of facility. So those are two examples of, uh, the, the, uh, of other people thinking that Edinburgh has something to offer. Right, at that point I'm going to stop and I'm going to introduce Shannon Valor, who's my colleague. I have a little bit of detail here, so I'll just embarrass her by uh, reading out her bio because she may not do it. I know she's going to introduce the other panelists. Um, Shannon gained her PhD in philosophy from Boston College before taking up a lectureship at the University of San Francisco and subsequently a chair in philosophy at Santa Clara University. She's a former chair of the Society of Philosophy and Technology. She won the World Technology Award in Ethics in 2015. She's written extensively on ethical issues in emerging technologies, including the book Technology and the Virtues, A Philosophical Guide to a Future Worth Wanting. And she's also written another book recently which is available as preprint but not yet released called The AI Mirror. And she may re refer to some of the contents of that um, uh, this evening. But again, that's going to be another book worth reading. And as testament to uh, Shannon's excellence and the way she's seen in the field, uh, she was invited uh, to give en uh, evidence to a US Senate uh, Home Security Committee just yesterday. Um, and we have video footage of that if anybody wants to see it. So um, I'm sure Shannon will want to watch it back if she hasn't done already. But um, even the US Senate uh, has taken advantage of this visit by a delegation to, uh, from the University of Edinburgh to the United States this week. So um, Shannon, if you'd like to come up and bring up your panelists, and then I know you're going to make a few initial remarks. Um, at the end, we'll have time for questions and answers. I'll be very happy to answer any questions on any aspect of the university generally that I've either talked about or that you've, you want to know about, um, but I'll come back at the end. But for now, most of the rest of the evening is going to be given over to the subject of artificial intelligence led by Shannon. So Shannon, over to you and your panel. Thank you, Peter. And uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, it's lovely to see uh, everyone here uh, on such a lovely November 
Palo Alto evening, which uh, as someone who spent my life in the Bay Area until moving to Scotland four years ago, uh, where it is currently getting dark at 4 p.m., uh, it has been quite a pleasure today to be wandering around uh, the Stanford campus in downtown Palo Alto enjoying this glorious weather, uh, which I hope uh, at least you get to enjoy for a little bit longer. Um, I'm also really grateful to our panelists to today who all introduced for a moment. Um, for me, coming back to uh, the Bay Area for a visit is uh, very much uh, a homecoming, uh, literally and uh, figuratively in a way, uh, but Scotland uh, is, is now, uh, for as long as they'll have me, uh, my, my true home. And um, it's uh, really, I think, for me, uh, important that the conversations that are happening now around AI link across these geographic divides, uh, but also the disciplinary divides uh, that in academia often limit our ability to address complex challenges, uh, and the divides between academia, industry, policy, government. And one of the things that's really exciting about the AI conversation right now is how many of those divides are starting to be bridged, in part because of the urgency of the concerns around managing the risks and benefits of AI's development and ensuring that we're governing it responsibly. And that's a conversation now that's being had in the UK, in the United States, in Europe, in China, in every part of the world. And there's an increasing recognition that a great deal for the human family hangs on getting it right. One of the things that was particularly interesting about um, the opportunity uh, both to have this conversation uh, with this very distinguished panel uh, of experts here tonight uh, was that it's a, it's a bit of a bridge conversation uh, from some of the things that were on the minds of, of uh, myself and the other panelists at our Senate hearing yesterday uh, for the Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee, uh, which was uh, titled A Conversation About uh, the philosophy of AI and also the historical perspectives on AI that we need to gather and grasp in order to understand the future with AI and make sure that it's a future worth wanting. So that was really the theme of uh, the, the hearing yesterday. It was myself, uh, Darren Asamoglu, uh, an economist from MIT, and Margaret Hu, uh, a legal scholar from William & Mary, uh, thinking about what history tells us about where to go uh, next with AI. And tonight we're going to talk about AI past, present, and future because so much of what we're hearing about AI is about where AI is going to take us. But I would like to suggest, and this was something I said in my testimony yesterday, uh, that if someone uh, asks you the question, um, where do you think AI is taking us, they want you to believe that you're already out of the driver's seat. That is, they're not asking you where you or we will take ourselves and AI together, but asking you to imagine that AI is now driving the bus. Uh, and that's a very dangerous framing that serves certain interests, but certainly does not serve the interests of all of us here uh, or all of us around the world uh, who want to make sure that the tremendous benefits of AI are not just successfully realized, uh, but uh, equitably distributed across uh, communities, across nations, across the human family. Uh, and that the risks of those technologies, because no technology is ever perfectly safe or risk-free, that those risks can be mitigated and wisely managed, and also that the price of those risks, the costs, the suffering, uh, the uh, losses from some of the risks of AI that we're already seeing don't continue to be suffered by the most vulnerable and the least empowered to uh, receive justice uh, and recourse for those harms. So that's the context for the conversation uh, tonight. Uh, we have with us today uh, three um, incredible uh, and uh, uh, experienced scholars uh, and uh, thinkers and uh, policy leaders around AI that can help us set the stage and maybe 
understand uh, what's really in front of us and how we can exercise our own agency uh, with AI uh, a little more effectively uh, than uh, if we listen to some of the media narratives around AI uh, that are currently crowding out, I think, uh, some wiser voices. So among those wiser voices are uh, Christopher Manning here, who is the uh, inaugural Thomas M. Siebel Professor in Machine Learning in the Departments of Linguistics and Computer Science at Stanford University, Director of the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, or SAIL, and an Associate Director of the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence, HAI, H-A-I. His research goal is computers that can intelligently process, understand, and generate human languages. And uh, he was an early leader in applying deep learning to natural language processing. We also have with us uh, Rob Reek, who's a professor of political science and by courtesy professor of philosophy at Stanford University. He is the former director of the Center for Ethics and Society at Stanford University and co-director of the Center on Philanthropy and Civil Society. He is also associate director of High Stanford's Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence. His scholarship in political theory engages with the work of social scientists and engineers and has written extensively on ethics and technology. Uh, and his uh, uh, most recent books are Digital Technology and Democratic Theory, which came out in 2021, and System Error, Where Big Tech Went Wrong and How We Can Reboot. So please do check those out if you haven't already. And then finally, we have with us uh, Irene Soleiman, who is an AI safety and policy expert and head of global policy at Hugging Face, where she conducts social impact research and leads public policy. Irene serves on the Partnership on AI's Policy Steering Committee and the Center for Democracy and Technology's AI Governance Lab Advisory Committee. She is also a tech ethics and policy mentor at Stanford University and an International Strategy Forum Fellow at Schmidt Futures. She advises responsible AI initiatives at OECD and IEEE. Her research includes AI value alignment, responsible releases of AI tools, and combating misuse and malicious use. Irene was recently named MIT Tech's Reviews 35, among te MIT Tech Reviews 35 innovators under 35 for her research. So uh, let's start the conversation. Uh, we're going to keep it uh, loose and informal and friendly. And we're going to have some time afterwards for questions, uh, which I believe Peter will be uh, facilitating. So please, uh, as the conversation develops, uh, consider what questions you might want to bring to us. And uh, we'll be excited to, to take them on. Thanks. Ah, it's always nice to sit down. OK. So uh, as I mentioned, we have a media narrative that's very much focused on uh, this idea of the future being a, a, an unknowable place that AI is taking us. Uh, but before we begin to maybe think more uh, deeply and carefully about that narrative, and this was highlighted by Peter's remarks that Stanford and Edinburgh have been studying artificial intelligence for over 60 years. There's an important past here to consider. Um, so I, I want in a moment to, to bring us to that past and, and pull some things out of it that might help um, uh, the, the room maybe understand the context of, of this present moment. Uh, but first of all, I just want to point out that for, for those of us working in the, in the AI field in one way or the other, whether it's ethics, policy, uh, the technical side, the, the, the governance questions, the last few weeks and months feel like chaos, uh, a very exciting kind of chaos, right? But AI is on the tip of everybody's tongue. Uh, it's uh, the headline of endless breathless media narratives. Uh, leaders of nations are suddenly putting it at the top of their priority list. Um, and for those of us who've kind of worked in AI at times when it was a much quieter world, right? I think it can be challenging to figure out um, what we want to say or, or what, what we're making of the, the present 
vast noise around AI. So I just want to give each of you a couple of minutes, maybe, um, to say what, what has been on your mind lately uh, in the midst of all of these voices who suddenly have entered the AI conversation? What have you been focusing on? Um, I'll start with you. Chris. Okay. <clears throat> so in the main, I'm focused on the technology and the science of artificial intelligence. And so there's you know, lots of AI hype. There's lots of concerns, worries, biases, public policy, which I'm sure we'll hear um, lots about later today. But I really think for a large percentage of the people who are involved in the science and the technology of AI, it's just an incredibly exciting time because it's been such a rapid period of scientific progress, right? So um, I've been doing this for around 30 years, I guess. And, you know, there have been sort of ups and downs across that period. But, you know, really um, with the reemergence of neural networks that led into this kind of current technological boom that started around 2010, so that, you know, the pace at which exciting technical challenges were being solved, systems were getting much better, there were new ways to understand and do things, just started to rapidly improve in the 2010s, much more so than it had in the 15 years before that. I'd love to talk more about the history. It's one of my we favorite will. topics, um, but I won't go into it right now. But, you know, really what happened in most of the 2010s, it seemed like, whoa, things are really taking off. But, you know, in retrospect, they'd barely taken off at all um, in the um, most of the 2010s. Towards the very end of the 2010s, um, 1920, um, they, took, they clearly took off more, and it seemed like they're really, really taking off. But, you know, in retrospect, again, they'd barely taken off at all, that, you know, from the perspective that we're at now, where AI really took off was when ChatGPT was released. And, you know, that was still less than a year ago. ChatGPT was released on November 30 of last year. So again, close to the one year anniversary. I mean, I kind of find I have to keep reminding myself that that was less than a year ago, because it now sort of seems like we've had ChatGPT forever, and so much stuff has happened since then. But I mean, it just had, although you can talk about the antecedents of it, it just had this singular effect of here was this um, computing device which you could, you know, ask questions, give it instructions, get it to do all kinds of nifty things. It really gave this sort of, whatever its imp imperfections, this sort of sense of here was actually an artificial intelligence device that had a generality of operation that you could ask it to do all sorts of things. You could ask it to sort of rewrite um, the US Constitution as a rap song, or you could get it to explain um, the meaning of some piece of text for you, right? Like, or you could get it to generate a poem if you were having trouble with what to send to your, um, someone that you want to send a poem to. Um, <laughs> that, um, that um, you know, it was just this amazing breakthrough artifact, and then we've been sort of building on that later. But, you know, I think there's just this huge, genuine scientific excitement coming from these new capabilities. Mm. So like Shannon, my own disciplinary background is, is philosophy. And you know, hearing Peter describe Stanford and Edinburgh as the, you know, having the oldest disciplines or departments of artificial intelligence, it goes back 60 years um, compared to philosophy. We've been asking the same questions for millennia. And the questions are the same. The answers may change. We can debate whether there's moral progress. Uh, but it, it's, there's a sort of amusement um, I, I have when, when I have the privilege to work with people who, um, like Chris, are, are doing this frontier work in artificial intelligence and machine learning. And this gets to the observation that I wish to make about the moment we're in, because yes, we could say it's less than a year since ChatGPT or since the, the, the neural net revolution starting in the 2010s. But the kind of perspective I want to bring is the thing that's on my mind is to think about an umbrella term called AI governance, which is different than AI ethics and different than AI policy. Mm -hmm. um, AI governance is how I like to describe the work I'm doing because it encompasses things that you can reasonably describe as AI ethics and AI policy. AI policy, people tend to assume it's 
the kind of regulatory approach that emanates from government or governments, and indeed there's been an awakening of, of, of that across the world with the EU leading the way and the UK AI Summit, the executive order from the White House just last week as well. Um, but in addition to formal rule-making or regulatory um, efforts from government, AI governance allows us to think as well about the norms and standards that emerge from the very practice of the profession itself. So how is it that AI ML engineers think of what is the responsible development of the things that go on in their field? How do they coordinate across the different places they work, even if they're in marketplace competition, but they're keen to figure out, well, what does it mean to do work well and responsibly? Um, and that should be more of a shared practice. So let me give you a concrete example that I have in mind about something that people talk about right now with these extremely powerful large language models or foundation models. Any of the large companies, OpenAI, Anthropic, um, Google, um, the models that are hosted by um, um, Irene's company, Hugging Face, uh, they'll undergo what gets called as red teaming. Um, there'll be a whole bunch of people that are hired or maybe contracted in order to like test out the capabilities of the models and then to see whether they're capable of doing bad things that then the company wants to try to contain before it releases the model. There are no common approaches yet to the practice of red teaming. Each company more or less makes it up from scratch and one company's red teaming exercise will look completely different than another company's red teaming exercise. So what I draw as a lesson from that is the the norms of what it means to do this frontier work are just in the initial moments of formation. Or to put it critically, Chris has heard me say this before, I'm worried he's gonna grimace because he's heard it and sometimes <laughs> criticizes me, but I'm gonna say it for the group here. Um, AI ML engineers are developmentally immature. It's a place that's only 60 years old. And so unlike, say, research and development of drugs in the biomedical field, much older, lawyers or other kinds of professions that have been around for a while and developed these common standards, um, AI and ML folks are like teenagers. They're 19-year-olds who are newly aware of their great power, but their frontal cortex is massively underdeveloped and they're socially irresponsible. <laughs> and so I think it's time to get the philosophers and other folks around, more people with some, some sense about what it means to develop norms that philosophers can't impose from above, that would be a disaster, but working in tandem with people can help to surface things like red teaming or benchmarking or safety testing in a whole variety of ways, things that won't only emanate from government but come from within the profession and come to be understood as common practices that are important to do. Why? Because it's what a good AI ML engineer does. And there's so little sense of that right now. Um, that's why the, the youth of AI is both a virtue and a real vice. That's fantastic and I wanna come back to this because I think also not just think about the history of AI but the history of technology governance yes. uh, is something that is often underappreciated and this was one of the things we were talking about uh, on the Hill yesterday was mm -hmm. the lessons we've learned from other industries that went through phases of relative immaturity and had to be very quickly accelerated and grown up yeah. uh, in order to be made uh, safe and, and viable. So, uh, so I think there's hope, right, that, that mm -hmm. this is possible for AI too. Um, Irene, would love to hear your thoughts on just whatever is top of mind uh, amidst all of the kind of whirlwind that uh, is going on around your work right now. And what a whirlwind. Mm -hmm. My brain is largely formed, but as you could tell from my bio, I am under 35, and there's <laughs> been quite a lot, my, my, my great eye cream, credit to that. Um, but there's been a lot that's happened just in the past less than a year. I had the honor of being at Bletchley Park last week for the UK AI Safety Summit. We have a few more summits coming up, and there is such a theme of intense momentum, this international energy. The UK did an incredible job at international representation, and we're seeing more players in this space. I work at a company called Hugging Face. It is a startup, and we just don't have the resources that a big tech that has to coordinate internationally for a technology that does not have 
state boundaries. Uh, so especially in a policy conversation and a technical conversation that is truly global, we need not just representation internationally and in what it means for a system to work for many groups of peoples, but, and I want to calibrate on how exceptional this panel is, but we need intersectoral work. And I see this you know, with, with Shannon's work with Braid, and Hai has really, truly been exceptional here in many ways, and I have to cal calibrate policymakers too, that there needs to be more researchers, more academics in the rooms, frankly. Uh, policy is a very specific flavor of work that I don't see a lot of scientists in the room as much as there should be, uh, but Hai particularly and, uh, has, has been bridging the, the work of what we've especially been seeing in generative systems. I also just want to step back. Clearly, we've been talking about generative systems, and a lot of the AI world has not been specific to language models. Um, even in the past five years, I love working on language models. I find them fascinating, and frank, they're just not the most important AI system in, in people's lives. Um, they are well integrated into people's lives and have been more in the past year, and there's a lot of lessons that we can take from generative systems like language models to the more narrow systems that are embedded in people's lives, to predictive recidivism, to the kinds of real estate models that we see that are impacting people's daily lives. Uh, so this is where not just the technical expertise and the more popular systems today are important, but to really build capacity in more use case oriented policy is critical now. Fantastic, and so let's come back to this uh, kind of wider perspective on AI that includes not just generative AI, uh, which as has been uh, made very clear is, is an incredibly recent development in the history of AI. Let's widen back out and, and look back at uh, the foundations of AI as a science and what they can uh, tell us or what perhaps uh, I'd be interested, Christopher, in your thoughts on what you, uh, as someone who has been working uh, in this field for decades, what you wish uh, people who are only right now hearing the media narrative around AI that's been so fresh, what you wish they understood about the historical perspective on AI? Um, or do you think that's important for people? Yeah, I do think it's important. I mean, one area is just getting more of a sense of what AI is. And I guess Irene was starting to talk about this, right? Um, so in the intro, Professor Matheson um, already mentioned the fact that there'd been AI winters, right? So, um, the story people tell is that there were sort of two big AI winters beyond the, between the sort of the initial excitement and AI winter, the second round of excitement winter, and now we're into this sort of third age of AI. Um, but you know, this third age of AI's conversation has become so dominated with these large language models and foundation models that we sort of forget um, a lot of the tools that we have now that really are AI. Um, so, you know, everyone has their cell phone uh, or mobile phone and maybe in, um, <laughs> in European talk. Um, and well, you know, these mobile phones have truly excellent speech recognition, right? You can talk to them for your notes or to text or WhatsApp or whatever, and the speech recognition is near flawless. They may not always understand when you're giving commands, but the speech recognition is near flawless. Well, actually, for the first AI winter, one of the big causes of the first AI winter was the exuberant scientists had promised people, notably the US Defense Department, that they would be able to provide speech recognition. And in 1973, um, the US government decided these claims were a bunch of hot air and the people involved were nowhere near to providing speech recognition. But hey, here we have it and it works amazingly, right? So, you know, there's all of this AI um, that's inside your phone, which is of, you know, simpler AIs than the kind of things that people are really trying to make now. And I think we shouldn't forget that. Um, if I make one more comment, um, before going on. I think another thing to think about um, with these sort of um, booms and busts of AI is, well, firstly, this isn't, the, this isn't the first time that there's been an enormous amount of AI hype. If you go back 
um, to the early days in the 1950s and the 1960s. You can see it all over the front page of the New York Times in those days of saying, you know, um, mechanical brain that has been created to think for itself. Soon it will be doing this, that, and the other thing, right? There's just as much hype 60 years ago as there is today. Um, but the other thing to realize was, you know, the hype was um, always started by some genuine new capacities that had been achieved. Um, but above those, there was a huge amount of hype, and the, the crash came sort of with the hype coming down, but not the sort of scientific reality changing. I suspect that that's what's going to happen again this time, that, you know, we're going to have a flattening out. Um, for, yeah, maybe that's enough to talk about for now. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that's a great uh, bridge to the next question, which is, where do you think things are going? As I said in my opening, I, I often want to resist this framing that as if AI is a, is a force of nature, uh, right, that has its own trajectory independent of human decisions and priorities. Um, but as a scientific area of research and development, obviously there are certain uh, opportunities that uh, open up and that help shape the direction of the field, right? Certain things become um, more uh, available as capabilities, and then we build the next layer of the technology by uh, using those capabilities. So uh, from your perspective and from the networks of researchers that you talk to, um, do you have a sense of where AI research and development is heading next, uh, or where the incentives that are currently driving it are likely to take it? Um, or do you think that's something that's genuinely unknown? I have some thoughts from yeah, just actually please. the conversations yeah. with Chris and Rob right before this panel. I'm particularly bullish about smaller models. We hear about really large, powerful models that are incredibly impressive. And at Hugging Face, so kind of think GitHub for ML, we have lots of models and data sets. Some of the most popular systems that people use are narrow, smaller, more tailored models for specific tasks. Uh, for many reasons, they're also just cheaper to run, but often they work better for more task-specific purposes. Uh, so I, I'm particularly bullish about this in a research area. Chris and I were having this conversation, and Rob and I were having a conversation about the kinds of policy investments that we're seeing. We're seeing a lot of national security concerns about potential misuse as models scale. This, I used to work at OpenAI, and I used to work on the earlier, you know, the, the ancestors to chat GPT. Uh, and we were thinking about potential misuse, for example, disinformation, which I'm very glad we did that early. Uh, and there, there's valid concern for national security reasons around where, where systems are now. Uh, mm -hmm. But we also have to recognize the constantly evolving landscape for, for risks. And a big criticism of myself and, and the industry is we weren't prepared, for example, for academic integrity. We, we thought about it, but sometimes until systems are deployed, you're not really fully cognizant of how deeply it'll affect the average person and also what that feedback mechanism should look like in the power dynamics there. Elected officials, there's more places that we can go. We can go to Congress and have that conversation about electoral disinformation. Uh, and there is a power difference between elected officials and your average high school teacher. And there's not as obvious of a feedback mechanism to be able to have that academic integrity conversation. Hey, can I add something Practice. to this? So, um, this is a good example, the, the idea that Irene just mentioned of like not thinking about the average high school teacher and academic integrity. So, the title of this book that I wrote with some colleagues is called System Error, Where Big Tech Went Wrong. This is a good example, I think, of it, where the kind of well-intentioned and genuinely aspirational, sometimes even utopian technologists develop a product. And whether, whether it's because they failed to do due diligence or there's a race to the marketplace or some combination of all of these things, ChatGPT was a, a, an you know, something that arrived less than a year ago and immediately dumped on the back of millions of teachers across the entire world the problem of figuring out what to do about this extraordinary cheating technology that was just released for free to everybody. And there are actually some trivially simple fixes to this that no one has bothered to implement. There are also some genuinely hard fixes, say, um, 
can you do digital watermarking of machine outputs from, from these models? That's a technically much more complicated thing than some other things that could be done. But this is the kind of thing that happens routinely. The tech companies race ahead. They release something. They say they're piloting or beta testing or whatever it turns out to be. And then the rest of us have to find ways to adapt to it. So you have a discourse that's going on now about teachers should either go back to doing like in-room in handwritten exams to ensure that the students are, or they have to use ChatGPT or some other service and show how they edit the thing in progress. This is something that it would be much better if the companies thought about in advance and tried to work in tandem with the people who are going to be powerfully affected by it. That's what I would describe as the system error. If I can add just one more thing to, like, when I think about what I think is coming that I'm excited about. Um, so much energy has been put into pushing forward the capability frontier of the models. Um, let's build it with more data, with more compute, with more parameters. Let's see what types of emergent capabilities come from these powerful AI models. That's wonderful. That's what scientific progress looks like in many respects. But given how powerful many of these models have become, and you know, it doesn't just have to be about generative AI, it's also now evolving that people are putting resources into um, safety research that has this technical dimension. So not just pushing the capability frontier, but pushing the safety frontier forward. That's a good thing. And if I could be permitted just one more very big picture thought, this is the philosopher in me coming out again. Um, the kind of mission of HAI is an expression of this, the idea that don't just hothouse the, the computer scientists in a room and then the role of the philosopher, the social scientist, is once the thing has been designed and deployed, we get to observe it and comment on it. Instead, see if by collaborating in the lab together, you ask different questions about what technology might do or be asked to solve. This problem-solving approach done from a strictly technical standpoint can turn out to be somewhat limited. My colleague, the current chair of the computer science department at Stanford, Maron Sahami, sometimes says, you know, it, is it any wonder that there, there are so many startups in Silicon Valley who are trying to solve the following problem? People who work in Silicon Valley tech companies would like greater efficiency in having their lunch delivered to them by some <laughs> restaurant <laughs> delivery service. And people get super excited about the problem solving of the pain point of getting your lunch delivered. Um, those aren't the kinds of questions that occur when you widen the circle of people who get to be in the room together about the kinds of problems worth solving. And I think this idea of trying to solve wider, more socially significant problems is, is a hopeful sign of more people present in the lab together um, that hasn't so often been the case in Silicon Valley. Can Let I? me ask a follow-up on that, if I could. But then, then we'll come back, because uh, I, I know you, you want to come in as well. So I, I think the idea of, first of all, preaching to the choir about getting all these people in the room uh, yep. As I've said uh, multiple times to uh, uh, Peter, the reason I came to Edinburgh is because I could do that there in mm -hmm. a way that I wasn't able to do as a philosopher elsewhere. Yep. I've been working with AI researchers at the University of Edinburgh since the first week I arrived. Yep. Um, all of our grants are you know, philosophers, social scientists, law scholars, machine learning researchers, roboticists working together every week on these challenges. So I think that's an absolutely vital component. Uh, and you're right, it does help, particularly in academia and on the research side, it does help people broaden out the questions they're asking. But I think we have to talk about the commercial incentives yep. that currently exist in the AI ecosystem, whether it's the commercial incentives to pay to bring social scientists and humanities researchers and uh, experts in the law on, on, on board at an earlier stage to actually help you in ways that might take more time to get a product to market. And the ability to then say, well, let's take time to talk to the people who are going to be impacted before we release this. And let's make sure they have a strategy uh, that, or that we can you know, adjust the product to make sure that it's not damaging these institutions. How do we create the commercial incentives for that to happen? One of the things I'm interested in is, again, looking back at the history of technology governance, Thinking about things like environmental regulation, right? We at one point had to develop the polluter pays principle. Basically, you cannot simply externalize all of the costs and harms of your business model onto communities that are under-resourced and vulnerable and cannot cope 
with the pollution that you are, so you have to pay, mm -hmm. right? If you pollute, you pay to clean it up. That comes out of your profits, mm -hmm. does not come out of the community. Right. Um, and that also incentivizes when done right, which it doesn't always get done uh, with the right incentives. But when it is, companies then realize that it's often cheaper to make their operations cleaner in the first place right. than to have to pollute and then pay for remediation if you get the, again, incentives right. So we could incentivize companies to be more responsible, but we'd have to change their incentives. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know, it, I, I do want to come back, but, but Irina, from a policy standpoint, ha, is, are you hearing any discussion about meaningful changes to the incentives that AI companies are facing that might address some of these? And as the industry person, uh, there, yeah, I, I have to think about what folks are using our models for. And you make a great point about research and commercialization. Oh, there's such a fuzzy line, especially for language models. They are very much in research mode. And then sometimes we see research models being used for commercial purposes, which is particularly why I'm so bullish about capacity by use case. And I, I definitely want to hear from my colleagues on, on this panel, because I know we have thoughts about conferences and peer review processes and where they are mm -hmm. in this space right now. I think archive, this is a, a repository, is a net good. This is now controversial to say in the field. Um, but there, there's, I think, less publications and a less incentives for, for open research than there has been pre-chat GPT. Um, there's the peer review process is broken in a lot of ways. And to be able to, to find and properly support, it's not just fun, but build the infrastructure for the many different scientists who need access and to be able to improve systems. Uh, I'm also a researcher because I don't understand what work-life balance is and I love my computer. <laughs> and I, I have somewhat of a computer science background, but early on, it's not intuitive to everybody, and this is why we have user interfaces, to be able to query a language model through your terminal, and we've come a long way since the, the era, the, the Stone Age era of 2019. Um, but there's, what, what kind of infrastructure do we need to build as well? How do we support the, the many sciences, uh, expertises to make systems better? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Christopher, do you have yeah. thoughts on that? Um, I do. I want to actually move it to somewhere different, since I think this part of the conversation has been sort of completely about large language models, generative AI, which have been sort of dominating the conversation and the hype um, for um, a year. because they're exciting yeah. and new yeah. and so yeah. on. But I, th I think that's sort of really ignoring 90% of what's out there, that the fact of the matter is that, you know, that for machine learning in general and for using um, deep learning neural networks in particular, right, that we've just had this huge progress and that huge progress can be applied in almost every industry that exists in all sorts of places and many of those uses are just great and really helpful. And the problem more than anything is that, you know, a lot of those advances haven't actually really yet spread out across the broader economy, that they've been largely confined um, to the tech companies. But I think we're now starting to see new waves of startups that are working in every different imaginable corner of the economy, um, doing things with artificial intelligence, which are just hugely productive. I mean, to sort of pick a couple of random examples, right? So, well, uh, we wish our weather forecasts were better. Um, well, you can hope to use um, artificial intelligence neural network techniques to be doing better modeling of weather. That's something that's underway. We'd like to um, have better recycling. Well, in the construction industry, most used timber gets chucked out because it's viewed as, you know, too expensive and too much work um, to reuse it. Not all of it, but a lot of it. Um, well, that's the kind of thing where people are working on using computer vision algorithms to identify the nails, which can then be pulled out by your little nail pulling robot, and that that can make the reuse of recycled lumber much more practical. Um, you know, I could go on with more examples, but maybe I sh shouldn't go on forever, right? But, you know, this is sort of 
ask for any corner of the economy. I think there are good things that can be done and are increasingly starting to be done with artificial intelligence. And if we're concerned about things like climate change, well, you know, there are lots of aspects of that. But, you know, some of the solution is going to be having better technologies. And some of those technologies is making use of these applications of artificial intelligence. You know, another um, way that artificial intelligence is being used actually is to adjust the diet of cows relative to the, the soil of where the cows live. So you can have sort of customized cow feed relative to the location the cows are. So they belch less and therefore they only emit half as much methane, right? You know, that actually makes a significant difference to methane emissions, right? So there are just opportunities to use AI in all areas of the economy, a huge percentage of which are just clear wins. Let me follow up on that. Are, however, the commercial incentives aligned with taking those benefits and making those the focus of AI investment, of, of cutting edge AI research? Of, is that where the best talent, for example, in AI is going to? Or are the best and most talented researchers in the AI field going to be drawn to work on tools that might be aligned with a uh, more data-centric, large platform company business models that may not translate into those kinds of applications so easily. So I guess my question, this is something I'd like to hear all of you uh, say something about, especially being uh, uh, in the heart of you know, VC uh, uh, land, is the investment, for example, in the next few generations of AI going where it needs to go? Is it is it funding the kinds of applications you're talking about at the level that it needs to be to see those benefits distributed at scale? Or is it going perhaps to applications of AI that from a commercial standpoint are very attractive, but whose benefits may not obviously outweigh the risks? Um, I think the answer is it's a mix. I certainly don't want to argue it's perfect, it's quite imperfect, but it's not completely wrong. Um, uh, by which I mean, you know, <laughs> what venture capitalists fund is very um, influenced by hype cycles. And so, you know, two years ago, just about every venture capitalist was funding crypto investments and they nearly all lost their shirt. Um, and well, a lot of the venture capitalists who were, you know, deep in crypto um, two years ago now say they're deep in AI. So and, this isn't reassuring. And, and, that, and, and that's not yeah. very reassuring because we're now in an uh, AI hype cycle and you get these sort of new AI companies. So I guess one of the recent, you know, there are lots of them, but one of the recent ones is sort of um, Inflection AI with Mustafa Suleiman and um, Reid Hoffman and, you know, they sort of stick up their shingle and immediately they're being, you know, given a hundred million dollars on a billion valuation because they're sort of known people. And when you're mentioning the human factor, yeah, lots of smart, um, smart AI researchers want to go and work there. And so, you know, so yeah, I'm not telling a very positive story, but the other <laughs> half of that story, which I also believe is, you know, <laughs> fundamentally investors and venture capitalists do want to make money. Um, and I think, you know, Again, a I'm lot, still not a seeing lot of, the good no, side. No, a lot of these companies with unclear business models and unclear impacts on the world aren't eventually going to be the companies that make the most money. The companies that are the best investments for venture capitalists are actually in areas that are underexploited in the, the technology isn't there. Um, lots of competing companies aren't there and a successful company um, can be extremely successful and return outsized returns. So if you can 
do something very successful in a different industry such as construction, the amount of money you need to put in is limited, the amount of upside is huge, mm -hmm. where if you want to be funding a competitor to OpenAI, the amount of money that you have to put in is gargantuous and the chances of you getting a large return on that money are pretty slim. And so therefore, fundamentally, it is a bad investment. And you know, notwithstanding all the hype, I think there are enough brains in the investment community that there is this counteracting force that does also push money into good places. Okay. Are you as sanguine about this? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm take, sure he is. Well, well, I, 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 you might regard what I'm about to say as friendly. We'll see. Yeah. Um, when you ask about you know, how to think about the political economy, the incentive structure of venture capital and the talent flows and what it funds. So, there's a, um, a, a friend of mine who runs a venture firm here in the Valley. Um, his name's Roy Bahat. It's Bloomberg Beta. And he just published this recent essay, which I thought was very nice. It takes a different way of thinking about what you've just been talking about, Chris. So he says, um, imagine funding artificial intelligence companies to do a variety of things, all these use cases you were describing, amazing potential upsides. He says, if you think about AI as a kind of tool there are three kinds of tools as a general matter, and he calls them a loom, and a loom is something that displaces human labor. It does what humans used to do for them, and so the human is not needed anymore. That's the technological displacement of labor. A second kind of tool is a slide rule. It doesn't displace the human. It makes the human more efficient at what the human's doing. It can do, the human can do something quicker or faster, more accurately with the slide rule than they could beforehand. Those are some helpful tools. It doesn't displace the human. A third kind of tool is like a, a crane in construction. It enables humans to do things that they couldn't do at all beforehand. And his critique of the venture capital is, venture capital funds too many looms and not enough cranes. It would be much better for the world if AI were being incented and funded to extend the capabilities of what humans can do, rather than to try to replace them in the jobs that they have. Those are human choices, totally consistent with the political economy. And there's low-hanging fruit on job displacement, and maybe it's more speculative to do the crane development, but it'd be great if venture capitalists funded more cranes rather than more looms. Irene. It's the classic question of how do we augment and not automate out. And I want to go back to Rob's opening statement about where talent is going. Hype cycles, not only to Chris's point, do shift money, but they also shift talent. I don't have as much insight as probably my, my co-panelists who have more uh, insight into, into academia. Um, but I imagine that a lot of students are looking into computer science. A lot of them are looking at generative AI systems, uh, and we see a, at my company, Hugging Face, we see a lot of academic researchers using language models today. Um, I don't have the hard data on what that looks like over the past few years, but definitely huge uptake in the past year. Uh, so where, where folks are moving, I think, is shifting. This, this is why so much of the conversation is around language models. Uh, but that said, there's exactly to Chris's point, there's so many untapped markets and these are conversations that I, as the head of policy, have with, uh, with members of Congress around how do we empower different sectors? How do we look into ag tech? How do we work with um, people who don't have a computer science background who want to integrate systems into the work that they're doing? And also, when do we step back and say, hey, AI is not actually what you need here. I've been telling all policymakers to invest in trains. I'm not very big on self-driving cars. But like, what if we recognize that AI is not the answer? And then there's a you know, technological, but not as fancy, not shiny uh, solution here, and be able to, to have that discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm really appreciating that point, because I think um, often what we're seeing is that the hype cycle ends up uh, narrowing people's conception of what technology is. Uh, and also, uh, be, w then when it falls short, because we're using the wrong tools uh, for, the, for the wrong kinds of problems, the, then what happens is people begin to see um, these technologies as 
uh, not something that they trust, not something that uh, they're willing to bring into their lives. We talk about AI being everywhere, but actually, I hear a lot of people expressing a great deal of fear about AI. And it's not just kind of wider lay publics who don't know, who don't touch AI at all in their lives or don't have to make any decisions about it and just hear about it as a scary thing. There's that. But there's also businesses and government saying, look, all I'm hearing is that these tools you know, fabricate falsehoods, mm -hmm. um, that they're opaque and can't be entirely predicted, that they amplify racial and gender biases even when we're trying to do something good with them. And there don't seem to be any, as to your point, Robert, earlier, we don't have agreed upon standards for how, we have a lot of tools actually that mm -hmm. we've developed over the last 10 years in mm -hmm. responsible AI work yep. for mitigating a lot of these risks. A lot of those tools developed in industry, Hugging Face has released some great tools. The stable bias thing is, mm -hmm. is very cool. You should check it out on their website. But we don't have the standards, right, right to, to apply these tools across the board. So it is, I think, still a risk that people might turn against AI and its potential, right? Public attitudes towards AI have soured in some recent surveys. Mm -hmm. And we saw, for example, what happened with GMOs and nuclear power, where the potential benefits of those technologies couldn't be fully realized mm -hmm. when public trust wasn't uh, earned along the way. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, perhaps the last question we have time for before Q&A. When you hear people express fears around AI, whether it's um, fears about existential risk in Terminator scenarios and you know, superhuman AI taking over, or whether it's just fears that these technologies aren't yet fit for purpose uh, or well-governed enough that people can afford the risk to adopt them, what do you think we need to do um, in light of uh, that current, uh, particularly as people I think everyone on this stage wants AI and its potential to continue to develop fruitfully. So what do we need to do in order to counter those fears um, or address the root of them? Uh, who wants to go first? Right. I'll go first if you like. Um, so, you know, again, inclined as a philosopher to take a big macro picture here. Um, I think we're at the dawning era, not of AI, although that might be true too, but of the dawning era of a society-wide conversation about it, including this policy window that's opening. And if you look back over the course of history at technological breakthroughs or scientific discoveries, um, government does lag behind the, the frontier, as it should. That's a feature, not a bug. And we're at the beginning moments of what will be you know, a decade or longer phase of trying to develop a bunch of social guardrails around technology. One of the things that I find also is a kind of sign of the relative immaturity of tech -tech technologists is the fact that unlike almost any other product that's brought to market, technologists seem unique in thinking that there should be a techno-libertarian approach. No regulation is better, it stalls innovation or something. But if you think about anything else, a car, an airplane, a train, the milk that you buy in the store, the, the drugs that you get um, um, from, your, from your doctor in a pharmacy, all of these have just simple guardrails installed by government to make things likelier to be safer, not guaranteed safety. And Technology products have virtually no, no guardrails, and there's a claim that we don't need them. Just let us do the work ourselves, trust us, and this gets back to what Shannon's saying. I think that's a mistake, and we're, we're beginning to exit that era, and that's a really good sign. And so, I mean, I'm not intellectually inclined to declare myself an optimist, but um, I, I would say, <laughs> the grass shoots are arising for the ordinary response of democratic institutions and the rise of professional norms, that this could be um, just a, a developmental phase that's very socially productive and will make a safer world for all of the fantastic use cases of AI possible where we'll begin to mitigate and contain some of the harms. We need to you know, accelerate the maturity of the technologists and accelerate the talent of technologists that go into government in order to help make wiser regulation. I love that. I think that's as optimistic as you can be as a philosopher without committing professional suicide exactly. on the spot. Yeah. Yes. Uh, all right, uh, Irene. 
Well, trust needs to be earned, and industry should not be setting all the rules for regulation. I think there's a lot that industry needs to be doing. Uh, Rob and colleagues wrote a great piece about community norms on especially release methods. And there's, there has been incredible progress on, for example, documentation uh, and just evaluating your systems, red teaming, there's a lot that's happening without the regulatory pressure, but there needs to be the kinds of voices that we have on this panel, hopefully you in the audience, and I think a lot about what Dr. Timit Jabru said, that you do not need to be an engineer, you don't need to be a developer to understand how a system could potentially harm you. Mm -hmm. And the question is, how do you engage? How do you make your voice heard? Uh, does that need to be particularly with your government? Um, I also strongly believe that many Aspects of policy are deeply integrated and AI safety cannot be decoupled from human safety, especially in a time where we need global coordination uh, and especially global South voices. What does it look like to not just have representatives and, and governments are not always the best representative of a people worldwide um, present in these conversations? I'm in so many rooms, there's so many boards, there, there's a lot of conversations happening right now. Um, and how do we also synthesize that? I think the summit was a great example of that. But um, we, don't, we don't need that many boards anymore. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, Christopher, you're going to have the last word, although we're a little bit over time. So if we can be brief, but what are your last thoughts as the AI optimist uh, oh, uh, on the stage? Uh, so Leave us with you, something positive. All the people in the audience, how many people have used ChatGPT or another tool like that, Bard, Claude, to help write some piece of text that they didn't really want to write? Uh, <laughs> well, Thank you. It, at least honesty there in the front seems row. Seems like at least about <laughs> half the people there. I've done it too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, were you scared? Um, did that scare you or did it seem like, oh, thank God, that gave me something to start from and I could work from there? You know, I, I think... Fundamentally, we're seeing AI enter our life, whether it's the sort of speech recognition on our phone, all those other things that are on our phone, you know, like when it's the, you know, driving directions on our phone or, you know, machine translation on our phone or, or using ChatGPT, which you can also do on your phone now if you want, right? And we see it and we I think it is useful and we're not actually scared by it. And I think that's actually a lot of what will go on. Now, at the same time, there's then, you know, there's the science fiction of the Terminator, Blade Runner, etc. And there's then sort of fanned into a world of fear, um, which is really being sort of hyped up by certain people around the world at the moment. You know, I, I don't really think that's what's happening in the world around us. That doesn't mean we don't need regulation. I'm in total agreement with um, Rob. I absolutely think that there should be regulation, but where there should be regulation is in uses of artificial intelligence. In many sectors, use of artificial intelligence absolutely should be regulated, and it's a shame that many of the legislatures and parliaments around the world are in such a dysfunctional state that they're not very good at legislating anymore. But, you know, I think we should be talking in terms of different use cases and what um, safety, fairness, and other requirements are needed there, and some of the other things that have come out, like the recent US executive order, when it was sort of saying, um, you know, constraints on how many parameters your model can have before you need to register it, and that that number is a thousand times smaller if it's a model that deals with biology. I mean, that just wants me to pull my hair out. I mean, that, that doesn't seem a sane thing to be making regulations out of. Well, I think uh, what we perhaps can agree on then is that there has to be a strong consensus that's built among AI researchers, AI ethicists, policymakers, people uh, with the expertise to understand what sort of regulation will be constructive uh, and will be genuinely protective of people's rights and interests and then try to have that consensus heard as much as possible by the people uh, that we uh, elect to act upon it. Wonderful. Uh, I'm going to now uh, invite uh, 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 Principal Matheson to uh, join us on stage and uh, take your questions, which we're really excited to answer. Uh, but I think actually maybe you have some thoughts on the uh, conversation you want to share. Uh, well, first of all, a round of applause. Thanks. Uh, 
and, and we'll give them another round of applause in a minute. Um, yeah, my, uh, my speech, my brief notes tell me that I'm supposed to make some reflections uh, on what I've heard. Um, and there's so many things I could say. Um, the emotion that the discussion gave me actually was one of gratitude. I'm grateful that there are people like you uh, from very diverse sort of viewpoints applying your brains to this, these kind of issues. For someone like me that doesn't really understand the technology, but always, I am an optimist, and I always say to people I couldn't do my job if I wasn't. Um, but actually, I want to feel optimistic about AI, and you gave me some cause to do so. So I was grateful for that, and thank you for the efforts that you and your colleagues are, are making. Um, Rob, your, your colleague who talked about looms, uh, slide rules, and cranes, that's a great analogy. I'm gonna, mm -hmm. I'm, I wrote it down on my phone. I'm going to use that somewhere, but that's really good. Um, the other thought I had, and I think it was um, George Santayana that said, um, that he or she who fails to learn from the mistakes of history is doomed to repeat them. Um, and I think that came over as well. The sort of relative youth of AI and the relative immaturity. Remind I always see medical, my background's in medicine, I always see medical parallels in everything. And there are two or three examples in medicine of exactly the same phenomenon. So when I did my PhD and we were trying to identify new genes and we were sequencing bits of DNA. We did it with radioactive nucleotides in a test tube and then holding up a piece of x-ray film to a light <laughs> to work out yeah. which base it was. That's the way we used to do it. That's not that long ago. Now everybody just sequences DNA by sending it off to a company and getting the result the next day. And so you know, that technology far outstripped regulation. And for example, the things that can be done to the unborn child in, in utero in terms of diagnostics and therapeutics have far outstripped ethics and law and regulation. So there are many, many examples from other fields of this same kind of phenomenon. And again, that sort of makes me feel optimistic because if, if you can learn from other fields and if, and if this is not actually as, as novel or as scary as people are trying to make us think, then actually we have to feel that this is a fantastic technology with massively important uh, applications that we can all benefit from. So that was my reflections on the field. Anyway, let's open it up for questions or comments from anybody about anything you've heard this evening. We've, we've got roving microphones. Um, please do use them and briefly identify yourself. I think this uh, person here right in the front was first. Oh, Annie, if you come here. All right, thanks, Annie. Thank you all for that. Um, Neha Gohill. Um, I wanted to ask for the optimists among you, um, we hear a lot here about the doom and gloom and just uh, what's about to hit us in terms of the impact of AI on democracy in particular. And I wonder if you might give us a glimpse, as you said, in many fields, um, it is actually building new opportunities. What do the opportunities look like uh, when it comes to democracy and AI? Okay, who wants to take that nice, easy question? <laughs> I'll give it a crack. So uh, <laughs> if I put on my optimist's hat, um, well, first of all, I'm going to channel some things from, from a, a, a scholar that some of us know here. Beth Novak um, wrote a book called uh, Smart, uh, Sm the Smart, Smarter Citizens, Smart State, or Smart Citizens, Smarter State, something like this. So imagine if we used artificial intelligence models, algorithmic models, to try to make much more available, accessible, and efficient interactions between government and citizens across a whole variety of agencies. So let's take as an example education. Um, not merely can you imagine all kinds of interesting personalized education tools and services, but even for really garden variety things. So if you have a child with special learning needs, at least in the United States, if you go to a public school, you get what's called an IEP, an Individualized Education Plan. plan. And it's written up in the language of an educational psychologist coupled with a lawyer. And so it's like two intersecting, unintelligible sentences in a document that's meant to facilitate your kid's learning needs, something deeply important to people. Now you can use AI models, a generative AI model, to upload it, say, ask it to translate it into ordinary language in two paragraphs. And now you can do that at scale for all kinds of things. Like imagine that in the ordinary workflow of a school. Imagine this in terms of the, the offering of all kinds of social services out of all of the dense jargon that sometimes attaches to it, but simple language that the model just spits out for you. Um, amplify this across a whole variety of things and you can imagine just more um, efficient and accessible forms of government that enhance the responsiveness 
of our elected officials to citizens. And Beth Novick will have dozens of examples like this. You can even get more wild and speculative about it. You know, so um, Chris mentioned this company, Inflection AI. The, the model they have is a, imagining a world in which each of us has our own personal assistant, personal artificial intelligence assistant, um, a kind of basically an agent of ours that's an AI model that represents us in various ways. Well, imagine that you know, based on everything this, 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 this model learns about you, it could then also scan the, the news and read about all the various people running for office and then give you the optimal person to vote for. And maybe after a while, you're not even necessary. You don't need to go to the voting booth. It's all automated. And you get an AI democracy, so to speak. Um, there are a variety of ways where it begins to get science fiction and worrisome. But again, like you can let, populate your imagination with a variety of things because these models are so protean. They're, they're capable of so many different things. And, expressible in all kinds of different applications. Um, so again, lots of upside and lots of potential downside. And the human choices we make will determine what happens, not the, as, as Shannon, I thought, correct, you know, so wonderfully put it, it's not a force of nature. It's not a, a gravitational force that just exercises its, its, its you know, energy or will on us. It's something that we make choices about. Shannon? Let me yeah. add something to that, if I can. So uh, two things, actually. So first of all, uh, Isaac, uh, Isaac Asimov wrote a short story in 1955 called Franchise, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, I used as the foundation of one of the chapters of my new book because it's about a, precisely this scenario where the uh, franchise of voting yep. uh, becomes something that uh, people treat as superfluous because the supercomputer multivac right, can anticipate for you what uh, you would have voted for given yep. these various uh, things that even you don't know about yourself. right? And I think one of the things it reminds us of, so science fiction can be very, uh, a very dangerous lens through which to mm -hmm. view AI because it can focus us on particular interpretations that might not, in fact, be accurate reflections of the, where the science is. But often, science fiction can also give us early warnings for the sorts of things we should be concerned about, right? right? And so I think even if you go back to Norbert Wiener, one mm -hmm. of the foundations uh, of cybernetics, and one of the first people who started to think about machine learning in a serious way, uh, thought very much about the relationship between automation and democracy and human agency, and expressed really deep uh, uh, reflections on how we can ensure that uh, human agency is enabled by right. intelligent automation rather right. than uh, suppressed by it. Mm -hmm. So I, I think to, to Rob's point, it really is about making sure we're conscious of those value choices that we make about the relationship between uh, AI and our power uh, as self-governing individuals. But the second thing I want to say is um, there's another really interesting way to think about the relationship between AI and democracy is to think about what are the biggest problems that democracies around the world faced. One of the greatest is corruption. right? And it's really interesting to me that when we use uh, AI to identify cases of fraud or corruption, we almost always target uh, the most vulnerable and least powerful members of society. Uh, this has happened in the United States, in multiple states, in Michigan, in Idaho, and other places. It has happened uh, in the Netherlands. It has happened uh, in Australia. And in almost all of these cases, the results have been disastrous. Uh, algorithms that were trained on biased human data that then amplified these biases in ways that targeted people because of their ethnicity or, or, their, or their race or gender or their economic status uh, and falsely accused them of fraud and corruption and imposed penalties that they could not uh, challenge uh, or uh, seek uh, redress for. Uh, so there's some horror stories there. But one of the reasons that that goes so, so bad is because the power dynamics are such that the people using those tools are far more powerful than the people they're subjecting uh, to those uh, tools. And if you f imagine flipping it, right, AI tools that are used to identify corruption in government, in uh, relationships between uh, actors uh, who uh, are uh, compromising democracy by undermining the will of the electorate uh, and 
the potential to use tools to identify signals of that kind of activity is really powerful, precisely because those people are never going to be put in prison or fined without human oversight and someone actually verifying that this red flag means something. Whereas uh, a person who's impoverished uh, or uh, un undocumented uh, is helpless, really, to say, this is wrong. I didn't do this. You can't, you know, you can't take my, uh, my job or my, or my benefits away. So I think one of the really important things about AI and democracy is thinking about where the power is in the AI ecosystem and making sure that we're using AI to uh, amplify equity and justice in the system instead of the reverse. OK. We are over time, but there's lots of hands. I knew there would be. Um, uh, yeah, if you could go here, yeah, the, if you do the two people next to each other, and then we'll come back here. So um, Christopher was talking about how there have been successive AI advances that all generated more and more hype, culminating with ChatGPT. Uh, but he thinks it might be leveling off. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, what do you think is the next AI hype, hype, cycle, hype, hype cycle after ChatGPT looks like, and what challenges do we need to overcome to get there? OK, hold that one for a minute, and we'll go to the person next door. Um, so recently, the Biden administration um, have planned to release uh, pol uh, policies to regulate um, safety of uh, foundation language models. And I wonder what is the implication uh, of these policies for small companies that are using these foundation models. Because I, I am a founder of a, uh, like a chatbot using large language model. In fact, I present my project in Stanford AGI. And we had a conversation with Chris previously. Um, so we try a lot of, we spend a lot of effort to try to red teaming our language, uh, our language model and evaluate a model safety, fairness, and trustworthiness. Um, but there might be still corner cases that we miss when we're trying to uh, jailbreak the model and red teaming the model. And I wonder what is your insight uh, for uh, our strategies to help uh, small startups uh, to evaluate model safety? Great. Okay, thank you both for wearing your uh, Edinburgh hoodies with your logos on there. That's great to see. Um, so, Chris, I think it was for you, really, the, the next hype cycle. So, I mean, it's been amazing what's been happening recently with technologies like large language models. But, I mean, technically the strategy has been very crude, right? It's been a strategy of scale. Spend 10 times as much money, throw in 10 times as much data, have 10 times as much compute being used, and that powers the next generation of GPT model, right? And then for the model that's going to come out in another two years, you repeat again, going up another 10 times. So it's a fairly unsustainable model past a couple of years. And I think we're also going to start to see that no matter how fantastic these models are, because you know it turns out more than anyone anticipated, if you can actually build a big enough neural net that you can sort of pour all of the knowledge and writing of the world into it, that gives you something pretty powerful. But it doesn't give you everything. It doesn't give you the power to reason, the power to make novel analogies, the power to plan um, that human beings have, the, even the power to adapt to a changing world. And I think we'll start to become much more aware of what the models don't give us. And I think we actually genuinely need further AI advances in areas that include reasoning, memory, planning, et cetera, that I was talking about to then kind of get us to the next level above that. Great. I mean, do you want to take the small stuff? I really question? do. I feel so strongly <laughs> about that one because this evaluation question is such a big problem that I keep on calibrating policymakers on. And to, to Rob's point on standards, like there literally is no standard on what constitutes a highly capable system, at least in the language model world. There's like a few capability evals that people threw because like the other guy did it. And I do say guy with a gendered term. Um, but especially on the safety side, that word safety is so loaded. In, in our current AI ecosystem. And I think one of the best evaluation suites we have is from Stanford's CRFM Center for Research on Foundation Models, which is HEIM, H-E-I-M, uh, -E the one for image generation just came out this week, mm -hmm. I believe. 
Um, and I'm working on one that everybody should be excited about around social impact, so that gives specificity to the social impact side, everything from biases and representations to environmental impact. And what I learned working with the com an incredible community across sectors on this eval suite, still ongoing, need to talk to CRFM about this, um, is just like how under-resourced certain areas are. So even within this big umbrella of safety, we're hearing a lot about catastrophic risk. There's some building and resourcing towards those types of evaluations, especially for social aspects of models. They just can't be quantified, but they also need to be quantified in order to get to mitigations. So when you're trying to like mitigate a bias, you're trying to put a quant you're trying to put a hard number on it and lessen it to zero. Very technical stuff. Um, but even the evals that do exist, most of what we have are more literature and language than we do for other modalities. And we have more along certain axes, like we have more evaluations for gender bias than, for example, religious bias. Um, so it's a huge problem. The UK AI Safety Institute and Singapore AI Verify are dedicated to building evaluation suites here. I'm very hopeful that the US AI Safety Institute will as well. I'm also hopeful that we won't have so many AI Safety Institutes, because again, I am a startup. I can't can't coordinate across all of them. But yes, this, this is a problem that is being worked on. Brilliant, thank you. We'll take a couple more quick questions. Yes, uh, here. Thank you, uh, Sarah Vibani. Um, I'm a computer architect, and I've been designing systems to optimize all kinds of uh, use. You know, um, did I did a bunch of graphics, and you know, now it's neural networks, and so I try to optimize it, and I try to reduce power, and so forth. But my question is, um, I took away two um, items from what you said, you know, all of you said. One was that uh, the regulation and uh, standard, sorry, standardization, uh, we need standardization and we need to have philosophers involved and then in, in the room when we, do, when we do this. And then the other thing I heard is, well, we, got to, we have to focus on the large language, mo the large models, you know, generative large models not just language models, um, uh, not inference, I guess, the actual trained models is where, where we're at, I guess, is what we're talking about. So um, I, I'm thinking, what can I do? You know, I, uh, I also work on standards and IEEE, and what can I do? Um, uh, you know, we're, we have the governance standards coming up, and we're really interested in socio-technical standards. So uh, tell me at what level uh, of these uh, generative large AI models or what should be standardized and at what level? Rob, I feel that one's for you or Shannon. You're, sure. the, two, you're the two philosophers. Well, I'll give you a couple examples. I mentioned a few of them before. Um, authentication digital watermarking. If there were a set of standards that were common across all of the outputs of whatever the model, that would be a huge help. Um, standards of red teaming. Let's, you know, we, standards of red teaming on biosecurity, on a variety of different other safety evaluations. Um, having some standards about what counts as um, you know, um, an appropriate way to do an evaluation. We could add into it things that have already been mentioned around, you know, this doesn't have to be large language models, just ordinary you know, algorithmic models of, of various forms of bias or fairness or discrimination, um, and to ensure that there is an algorithmic audit that is um, standardized for different particular use cases, whether it's in criminal justice or in education or in lending or whatever it turns out to be. Uh, we could keep going with these kinds of things. All of these standards, uh, you know, can can only be developed in proximity to the people who are developing the technology itself. You know, the executive order from the White House can say there shall be watermarking, but they're not about to build the watermarking technology from within the Office of Science and Technology Policy. It's going to be people like Irene who get brought in to consult on how about how those things go, and. This is the kind of thing which I think it would be helpful to have standards around, because at the moment it's not just the Wild West, that there's a sort of lack of, lack of um, incentive for any company to invest in it because it, it feels like they have to reinvent the wheel over and over again. And therefore, since there doesn't, it's not necessary to meet a standard, let's just not bother with it. Shannon, do you want to add to him? Yeah, I'll add to that. that um, so I mean, the example of algorithmic audits is is great because there are so many contexts where this will be essential. And again, AI is not one technology. And even when you're using uh, the same sort uh, of model, it depends very much on where you're using it and what you're using it for, what you need to govern. So you might have the same kind of model used in one context where there's no reasonable case for, for needing to do an audit 
uh, at all, and then another case where it's absolutely vital and it should be illegal for you not uh, uh, to use it within this context. So we have to have standards in order to determine uh, not just what a good algorithmic audit uh, uh, looks like, but um, who needs to do it and, and, uh, and when and where and how often, right? Because a lot of uh, the things we need to look at are also post-deployment, because these tools, even when they're very well developed initially, uh, can go into a deployment environment where the data starts shifting around and then the model's performance can degrade very, very rapidly or it can be, start behaving very, very unpredictably in ways that have to be monitored post-deployment. So I think standards are really important for being able to, to make those kinds of distinctions uniformly across the board so that uh, if someone says that this algorithm is safe because it's been audited, that's a meaningful statement, right? Right now, it, it sort of isn't. Um, Deb Raji uh, has done at UC Berkeley has done an immense amount of work on this. So if you're interested, for example, uh, in this, I would, I would look at, at her work. But to the broader point, uh, I would also just say that we have to be able to understand, and this is the, the concept that Rob was using earlier, governance is really the, the thing we're talking about here. And governance requires lots of different tools. And just like uh, uh, a person who comes to your house to fix something has a bag full of tools and their expertise is in knowing which tool to pick up for which problem, not everything will be solved by regulation. Not everything will be solved by internal company practices. Uh, not everything will be solved by transparency disclosures. Not everything will be solved by liability. Uh, uh, not everything will be solved by standards. But if you combine all of those tools, and this is what we've done in aviation, this is what we've done in uh, uh, civil and mechanical engineering. This is what we've done in pharmaceuticals. This is what we've done every other time that we've had to meet this kind of challenge. We've assembled a whole repertoire of governance tools that we adjust until we get the outcomes that we want. And there's no reason to think we can't do this with AI. OK, I think we're going to stop there. That's a great note on which to stop. Um, uh, we are, I'm going to hand back to my colleague Chris Cox in a second just to make a few closing remarks and particularly talking to uh, our alumni and friends here uh, that we're so keen to, to re-engage with. Um, but before we do that, please join me in thanking Shannon, Chris, Rob and Irene. That was great. Thank you very much. Chris, back to you. Thank you, Peter, and wow, what a conversation that's been. Fantastic. Um, I have two very short thanks, one slightly longer thanks. Bear with me, because I know I stand between you all and a, and a very well-earned drink. Um, and one final short and important thanks. So the two short ones. I first of all want to thank um, our alumni team, um, Natalie back at base in Edinburgh, um, uh, Katie uh, and Felicia uh, for their uh, close involvement in the planning of the content and the delivery of, ton uh, of tonight and indeed our other events in the States this week. Um, the second thanks to, uh, to, goes to my colleagues from Edinburgh uh, for their help this evening, for being with us for this evening, also for being such great company all week. Could I ask them all just to raise their hands, please, with a number of uh, colleagues um, here. Um, and, um, we are all really looking forward to the ongoing conversations with you later on this evening, so that's another reason for just pointing them out to you, so do please search us out. Um, so this is the third slightly longer thanks, and that's to you, our alumni and friends, and um, uh, for, first of all, coming to join us um, tonight and for your interest and support. Um, you support us in so many ways. You support, uh, through our alumni ambassador program, you help uh, us to attract the very, very best students to come to Edinburgh from California, which is absolutely terrific. Um, you help to mentor our students, um, and you, uh, you've played a really critical role in a fabulous program. I want to do a 30-second detour on the Insights program we developed a number of years ago. The, this is a program for our students from Scotland, typically from economically and in other ways more disadvantaged backgrounds, um, who often haven't had a chance to travel beyond Scotland. And we've developed a program funded by donors and with alumni being the critical hosts for them to travel the world to open their eyes to a whole range of opportunities. And the, it is a transformational experience for the students who've been through that. And many of you have hosted those students in your workplaces, and it's just fantastic. And that program is getting going again. So uh, we're, we're really grateful to that. 
um, you support our scholarships, which makes us, we're pretty certain we can now call ourselves the most generous university in Europe for access to education, so the best and brightest can really come to Edinburgh irrespective of their financial circumstance. That's hugely important to us and will be critically important in making sure students from all backgrounds have access to this extraordinary world of informatics and AI. And you spread the word for us, um, which is, and help us to build connections for um, partnerships in this part of the world and elsewhere. So we're enormously grateful. Um, you absolutely must come back to Edinburgh. That's just a straight order. I hope that's really clear. Um, and there is no sneaking back without telling us. That occasionally happens. We get very offended by that because we really do want to show you around and help build the connections. <coughs> you must come and see the Edinburgh Futures Institute, the old Royal Infirmary. But there's a couple of other buildings you might want to come and visit. Go to the McEwen Hall, where I, I imagine most of you graduated. That's had an amazing transformation in the last few years. And Teviot, where you're imbued now and again, I expect as a student and all sorts of other fantastic student uh, activities, that's undergoing a major refurb now and uh, as for the infirmary, will look amazing and very similar from the outside, but will look extraordinarily different inside. So do please come and visit those amazing buildings. Um, just a very final detour. AI and alumni, past, present and future. And it ties in with some of the ways that alumni are working with us already. So in terms of the past of AI at Edinburgh, um, we're building as part of the AI 60 celebrations really the fullest narrative possible of this extraordinary story of the initial development of AI at Edinburgh and, and in all its eras since. And even on this trip, um, we've been talking with alumni and filling some of the gaps in our knowledge, um, including, for example, the critical connections between linguistics and data science, which has always been at the heart of our work, um, and we're still world-leading in linguistics as well as data science, and particularly natural language programming, that's been absolutely essential. Um, but also even where the term informatics first came from. It's a very Edinburgh term. We learned a lot about that talking with our friends in San Francisco last night. So filling the, the narrative of our past in AI, in the present I hope tonight is a clear demonstration of we really want to engage with our alumni as well as a whole range of wider stakeholders on what this whole new brave world is going to feel like. The good news is, thanks to our panel, we clearly do have agency, so let's make the most of it. Um, and then in the future, um, the next Edinburgh Futures conversation that Peter was alluding to earlier is going to, is going to be in the spring and it's going to be on the future of education. Um, and Rob, it's almost like you would, you've been listening in on our recent conversations at Edinburgh in terms of what the impact of AI and digital technologies will be on the future of learning. And from an alumni perspective, we think this creates extraordinary opportunities um, for, to engage with you on an ongoing educational basis. Um, we already are world leaders in MOOCs, massive online open courses, um, two million users of those already, but just think the, the new innovative ways we'll be able to engage our alumni, both in the delivery of programs and in benefiting from those educational programs, including as our alumni adjust to career changes that may be necessary um, because of the, the changes that are coming to the workforce. But we think that again is an optimistic angle for us in terms of how we'll work with our alumni. Um, and this is now the final short thanks, but I do want to ask you once again to um, thank uh, Peter for his overview of the university, uh, Shannon, our wonderful uh, chair of uh, data and AI ethics, and the terrific panel that Shannon has helped us pull together for tonight's event.